Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Eli Sagor with the uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, I'm based at the Cloquet Forestry Center. Today we're down here in Green Hall, room 203, for uh, our August presentation and for those of you online webinar. Uh, really glad to have Marcella Winmuller Campioni here uh, with us today. She's going to be talking about ecological forestry to promote forest health, uh, to promote healthy forests. Before we get going, I have a couple of brief remarks I want to uh, just mention. Last month, Mark Nelson gave a really good talk on status and trends in Minnesota's forests relative to wildlife habitat. Uh, if you missed that presentation, it, uh, we did record it. And in fact, if you went looking for the recording already, you might have noticed some audio trouble. We have fixed that now. Mark and I re-recorded the first 10 minutes. So if you go to SFEC's website, you'll now see an intact, complete recording of uh, what I thought was a very good presentation by Mark Nelson uh, last month. Uh, this presentation will also be recorded. You'll find it on SFEC's website uh, within a few days. And those of you who have registered online will send you an email with a link to that recording. Uh, next month, we have uh, a presentation that I'll be delivering on kind of the future of SFEC. We're going to be meeting with our uh, executive and, and educational advisory committees next week and uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, what we are. SFEC is the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative based at the University up at the Cloquet Forestry Center. Many of you are familiar with it uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about where we're going with continuing education, adult education around forestry and natural resources next month. Uh, I'm also excited to uh, share that we're getting close to the start date for a revamped offering of our ecosystem silviculture cohort based course that's been offered several times dating back to 2005 uh, by SFEC in close collaboration and partnership with many others uh, around the state uh, and we kick that off October 3rd we're going to start out uh, that series uh, key players on that Marcella's very involved John Almendinger Cheryl Adams Paul Dubuque with DNR, Cheryl is with Blandon, uh, John Almendinger and Dan Hansen also with, with uh, DNR, Eco, uh, Ecological Classification Systems Unit. A number of others will be uh, joining us as well and contributing to that. We have 20 slots available and as of the last time I checked, which was yesterday, I think six spots remain available, 14 have been taken by other registrants. So if you would like to join us, we'd love to have you get that registration in soon. Um, that was a longer than normal preamble, Marcella. I'm taking your time. So I'm going to hand the floor off to Marcella. Uh, our speaker is Marcella Winmuller Campioni, um, assistant professor here in the Department of Forest Resources, uh, who, as I said earlier, is going to be talking about ecological forestry. Any uh, questions, uh, once again, or issues, use the chat pod. Please direct those to Eli Sagor. Marcella, you're on. Thanks, Eli. Thanks, and I'm really excited to be talking about ecological forestry today. Um, and there's no way I'm going to be able to cover this topic in the full extent in, <laughs> in about 50 minutes. This could be taught over a whole semester, so 14 weeks, maybe three or four credits. But I'm going to give, hopefully, a good overview. So looking at that overview slide. Uh, it's just, uh, sorry, Marcella. No. My bad. So let's go here. Oh, OK, thank you. Perfect. So we'll go through some history, a really brief background to set the context for where we are now with forest management, and then spend a good amount of time talking about definitions. So definitions are really important in silviculture and forest management. So talking about these different definitions, what they mean, what they have in common, and how we can use these. Um, after that, we'll take a break for some questions, um, talk about natural disturbance regimes, and then go into a few examples. So before I get into the um, lecture I want to, or the webinar, I want to leave you with some key thoughts. So um, ecological forestry, or one of the other terms we will cover in this webinar, focuses on using natural disturbance processes to inform and develop man management strategy which increase complexity. And we'll talk about this term natural, we'll also talk about disturbance, and then we'll also talk about complexity. So those are all words that can change depending on your goals and objectives. 
So we're still using the same silvicultural toolbox, but with different desired future conditions. So silviculture, we'll go through that definition too in a second, um, but we're using the same toolbox. It's just using it in a slightly different way with a slightly different desired outcomes. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We're using those same tools that you have in your toolbox already. And as our goals, as our objectives, as we manage for these broader ideas, whether it's wildlife, water, forest health, we're going to be needing to integrate and use these tools in new and different ways. So moving from conventional to alternative, uh, using ecological forestry concepts. These are all things we'll kind of cover in the next 50 minutes. So to set the stage, let's talk about um, Minnesota forest history or history uh, for that case across the lake states and throughout much of the United States. So early European settlers came here, they saw this vast endless forest. That happened on the East Coast. They slowly made their way to Minnesota, to the Great Lakes. Um, and I really like this quote about white pine. So the white pine of the upper Mississippi was the magnificent tree. Sometimes it stood in the forest 200 feet wide with a diameter of five feet. So these trees must have just been so impressive and also so valuable for what those early settlers needed. So they used them and they thought it was this endless supply. These logging camps sprung up. Uh, there was, and this in the truest sense, was destructive logging. The only thought was on removal. It was not sound forestry, forestry or silviculture. It was all about extraction and extracting it in the quickest, most efficient way possible. So that meant a lot of slash being left behind which we know well in Minnesota and throughout the Lake States, led to very destructive fires with the Hinkley fire and other fires occurring. But even after these fires, we were still in this golden age of lumber. So there was 1.5 billion board feet removed yearly between nine, or 1890 and 1910. That's a huge amount of lumber that's being removed. And remember, we're not talking chain saws, we're not talking conventional logging equipment, we're talking hand saws, and we're talking under snowy conditions and moving them down rivers and other streamways. So that 2.3 billion board feet in 1899 um, which was mostly white pine, could build 600,000 two-story houses. So this was the wood that built cities like Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, Minneapolis, St. Paul. This wood built these cities. It was not forestry. This was logging in the truest sense. This was the removal to build something. However, this removal was not sustainable, and there was only so much wood out there. There was only so many white pine that could be used for this. And after that 1910, I mean, it started, people started to realize that things were changing and this was going to end. Um, so certain logging companies started closing, um, lumber companies shift from pulp to paper and building materials. And then this is the really key piece. Um, there's this push for restoration and sustainable forestry. So we had the first state nursery established in 1903, the Cloquet Experimental Forest established in 1909, and the Minnesota Forest Service established in 1911. So these are huge already gains in this idea that logging is not, not the answer. We have to think about forestry and sustainable forestry. But to set this context, what these new forestry foresters, there's not even a forestry school, there's not many forestry schools even at this time, but what these situations are dealing with are cut over lands and how do you reforest that? And thankfully we had the Civilian Conservation Corps, I guess not thankfully because that was due to the Great Depression, but the Civilian Conservation Corps reforested millions and millions of acres across the United States. And it's estimated they planted over 25 million trees. And what they were doing, they were trying to reestablish the forest. So this was the goal, reestablish the forest. So now that we have this forest, 
how do we manage it? That's the big question. Well, we still need these products from the forest. And in the 19 forests, production was the key idea. So we we harvested, we just we logged these forests, we were starting to reforest. How do we maintain that? And that maintaining it was the goal of this idea of both sustained yield and production. So in the 1940s, we still needed to produce a lot of wood products for packing crates, bridges, railroad ties, all of this stuff. So this idea of how do we maintain the goods and services we need from the forest while still maintaining quality forest, sustain yield. That was the goal. Again, 1950s, we had this post housing war boom, but we have a little bit of a shift. All of a sudden it became a little bit easier to manage our forest with the, with the uh, increased use of a chainsaw, increased use of roads and vehicles to get to these locations. But we also had a post-war housing boom. So there is an increased need for this wood. Again, the forests were supplying a need. Um, so the students that were being trained at this time, their goal was to meet the needs of this housing demand. And then and an important other component is this national forest research. So this is the beginning, not, not the true beginning, but this is really where there is this very intentional input of resources to understand how forests grow, how they change, how they develop, and how we can use silviculture. So this is really extremely important to think about that, the context at how these forests were managed at this certain time. They were providing a very important need. So I want to make sure we set that context in when we think about history. It's really important to think about that context of why forests were managed in that certain way. Um, and that management for production, a really efficient and sometimes very effective way to manage for certain species is to use a clear cut harvesting system. If that species is early successional, if they need a large light environment, that clear cut harvest system can be very appropriate. However, sometimes with certain species, it's not appropriate. And as people began having more free time, recreating in national forests and getting outside, these sites became very uncomfortable. They also, if you notice, these are pretty big slopes that we're looking at. These, these are not the slopes in our backyard in Minnesota. Um, there, there's some erosion that can cause, there, there was some erosion. And these created this interest that are we managing the best way possible? And the Forest Service, so this came from research, this came from outreach, this came from people, but also the Forest Service really responded to this and said, wow, maybe we need to do more educational training for our foresters, for our silviculturists. And they've responded with this with very conscientious effort to train foresters into thinking about how we manage forest systems. And I think that's mimicked in a lot of state agencies as well as counties and examples like SFEC is a great example of how we use education and other organizations like uh, MLEP, did I get the acronym right? Yeah. Thinking about not only the foresters, but the loggers. We're all part of this natural resource community and understanding how we manage the system together. So this controversy kind of erupted and there was, there was some other controversies that shortly followed after. So there's this shift in values and there's this shift in thinking broader. So all of a sudden there's the shift that production is not the main goal of every single forest, that owls could be important, water can be important. And this, I mean, this owl was a huge kind of point of contentious uh, that left a lot of bad feelings on both sides uh, from save a logger, eat an owl. That's, that led to this divisiveness between, um, between different communities. And some people call this the environmental movement or the rise in the environmental movement. And I necessarily don't like that because I think foresters are environmentalists. I think they, they truly go into this profession because they love the forest and love what they do. But this issue set a very contentious, divisive um, period of time. 
And thankfully, I think we're moving to more of this collaborative environment where people are coming together, where different agencies are working together and looking at how do we manage for these different objectives and how do we work together to create resilient, healthy forest. So now that we kind of set that system up, what is ecological forestry? And I'm going to go through these definitions and we're kind of going to walk through some, both what ecological forestry is, but there's also some other definitions out there. So let's start with new forestry. So new forestry uses ecological principles to create managed forests superior to those created under current forestry practices. So I've highlighted some, some words. So I want you to kind of keep those in mind as I move through the next few definitions. Then we have this other definition, continuous forest cover or CCF. Continuous cover is defined as the use of silvicultural systems whereby the forest canopy is maintained at one or more levels without clear filling. Okay. Next definition, emulating natural disturbance regimes, ENDR. And yes, I will ask you for a quiz at the end of this if you can remember all the acronyms I've said. So management strategies and practices at appropriate spatial and temporal scales with the goal of producing forest ecosystems structurally and functionally similar to the ecosystems that would result from natural disturbances. Ecological forestry. The understanding of the importance of biological legacies created by a tree regenerating disturbance and incorporating legacy management into harvest prescriptions. Recognizing the role of stand development processes, particularly individual tree mortality in generating structural and compositional heterogeneity in stands and implementing thinning prescriptions that enhance this heterogeneity. And appreciating the role of recovery periods between disturbance events in the development of stand complexity. Okay, close to nature forestry. Guaranteed continuity of naturalness. Adopt a holistic approach involving continuous forest cover, adding value by selection, felling, and tending of all stages of development, working towards a balance on a small, on as small as a scale as possible between increments and harvesting in each management unit, use of natural regeneration, and restricting the use of exotics. And I think this is the last one. So we have alternative silviculture, and this is a favorite of mine, are characterized by a set of fundamental principles, including avoidance of clear cutting, an emphasis on structural diversity and small scale variability, deployment of mixed species with natural regeneration and avoidance of intensive site preparation methods. And I should say that all these references, all these citations that are in here. I have a slide at the end with the full citations. And um, so those are all there and will be provided at the end of this lecture. So we just went through two, four, six definitions. I'm going to slow this next slide to show you. We could have gone, we could have spent the whole 50 minutes talking about different ways or different titles for this idea of ecological forestry. So there's a lot of people talking about ecological forestry or this concept of using natural disturbance regimes, increasing complexity, thinking about these systems in slightly different ways. Uh, and this, this paper is a great one if you want to get a really good background on these different ideas, on these different views of ecological forestry. And just to kind of again show that these different terms may be used in different places. So that's why I wanted to go through these definitions. So we see that natural disturbance based management and ecological forestry does have this very much kind of lake states appeal, this Midwestern 
eastern appeal. Ecological forestry we have also on this west coast, which makes sense with Jerry Franklin being a huge advocate for it, um, where we have ecosystem management as well. Um, so there's lots of different words, there's lots of different terms that can be used or are used to think about managing forests in a different way. And these words aren't new, they, they date back. Um, so this is um, kind of the trend in um, continuous forest cover. And we look back pre-1878 in Europe, and there's this really big interest in this idea of continuous forest cover. We see this trend increase, and then we also see a change and a decrease in that use. And we're on this kind of upswing again in this interest of using forests, of, of managing forests for increased complexity. Um, and I'm not saying I have no idea where this trend is going to go, if it's going to flatline or if we're, we're going to continue to cycle. But how we manage forestry is really based on values and based on the needs and um, what society needs from our forest. And as we broaden, the type of management we're probably going to do or is going to continue to broaden. So now that we went through all of those definitions, what do they have in common? I'm actually going to pause for a minute and maybe if you have a piece of paper, write down some of your thoughts on what those definitions had in common and we'll see if we've got some of the same answers and I'll give you about a minute. I'll interrupt while people are doing that. Uh, folks who are online, feel free to type your ideas into the chat pod. I'll watch for them there if you would like to do so. Okay, so let's see what we have in common. So these were the things that really stood out to me, um, this idea of natural, and we'll, we'll discuss what natural means, and I'll give a definition that really resonates with me. Um, not conventional, so explicitly there are some that said move away from this clear-cut system. Um, we'll kind of talk about that too, disturbance regime. So this idea of using understanding disturbance regimes. What has the system adapted to? What does it respond to? And then finally, this idea of structural, compositional, and functional complexity. So this move from what is presumed to be the simplified clear-cut system to something that's more complex, whether that's including biological legacies, whether that's maintaining coarse woody debris, there's this move to maintain or add complexity to the system. So I want to kind of look at a few great figures um, to think about how the how we can view these um, both in the terms of a definition, but also some of these conceptual ideas. So ecological forestry is often described as a three legged stool. Uh, we like triangles in silviculture, we like triangles in forestry. Um, so this this makes sense why um, <laughs> it could be a triangle. But ecological forestry really depends on this idea of legacy retention, so maintaining that, these intermediate treatments, and then recovery pillaring, so allowing natural disturbances, allowing forests to recover and develop between events. And the idea is if you remove one of those legs, you're no longer able to use that stool. So you need these three components when thinking about ecological forestry. Um, this continuous forest cover one is a little bit uh, busier, but what resonates with me is this, this kind of nice picture of 
these mixed species, this mixed age classes, and this potential for for a range of multiple objectives that the stand could meet. So let's move into this loaded term of what is natural. <laughs> uh, I know I almost should have had organic on here too, and then we could have really <laughs> had a good discussion. But um, so there's lots of different terms or lots of different definitions for natural. And one of them that comes up um, sometimes often is without human influence and with specifically thinking pre-European colonization. And I think that kind of limits us because it wasn't, especially in North America, there was still, there were still activities going on. We were still looking at management. We were still interacting with the natural world. It wasn't, there were people here. Um, I guess I really like this definition by Kevin O'Hara, where when we think of forest management in the terms of natural, it's this shift in management where nature was controlled. So we were trying to control these processes in nature, trying um, to have everything within our control, to approaches that attempt to integrate natural process, to allow these natural processes to occur, um, and develop guides from these management. And I don't think any forest manager, any natural resource manager, any silviculturist is going to say that we as humans are able to exactly mimic nature. We're able to use nature as a tool to understand important processes and important functions. Um, I'm pretty sure anyone living up north in Jack Pine, Outwash Plains, or along the Barriga Plains, or anywhere on those very fire-dependent systems would kind of not like these huge stand replacing fires to occur every 100 to 200 years. That, that might be a negative impact to their house. <laughs> or, so we can use these tools to think about when wildfire, when these systems are not appropriate and when they are appropriate to use. Um, but it's integrating natural processes and thinking about natural processes in how we manage our systems. And so finally, one more definition. Um, and I think this one is a, a good kind of important one. So silviculture is the art and science of controlling the establishment, growth, composition, health, and quality of forests and woodlands to meet the diverse needs and values of landowners and society on a sustainable basis. So I wanted to put this one up here because we went through all these terms, ecological forestry, continuous forest cover, alternative silviculture, where in my opinion, I think silviculture kind of encompasses these things because it is based on science and it's based on diverse needs and values. These diverse needs and values are based on who owns the land, on who, on what we want on our public lands, how we manage. So if the value is to increase revenue, so if there is a need, say, school trust lands, to put that revenue back into the school systems, we're going to have a very different management than if the value is to maintain fisher habitat or the value is to uh, provide grouse habitat or whichever, or water quality. So it's based on these needs and values. And there are potential trade-offs in those needs and values. We can't maximize everything. Um, but I think silviculture this definition allows it to grow as we grow as forest managers, as we grow as researchers, as we grow as scientists. Um, so it really depends on the needs and values. And I guess um, these terms like alternative silviculture sometimes get used, but, and I use them too. I use them in when I publish things, um, but I guess I grew up on these terms. The silviculture I learned used ecological values and that's how I teach my silviculture class as well. So I think these are really important terms, but as, as new generations of foresters continue to 
graduate, continue to enter the workforce, these terms may they they might be synonymous with the silviculture that they learned at university. So, and then finally, thinking about these trade-offs, um, there's this really great triage concept of forest land allocation um, that Bob Seymour developed, and there. So there's three different components. There's ecological reserves, so pretty much untouched lands. New forestry, so this, this allocation, this use of ecological concepts, just like we talked about in some of these previous definitions, to add complexity, but you're still managing and producing a product. Some of those products may be timber, others may be increased water quality, increased wildlife habitat. You're still producing some kind of product. And then high yield plantations, um, because I like my wood to come from the United States where I know exactly the policies and regulations that are coming off, and off of these lands. And I am very sure that these plantations get replanted after they are harvested. And what, they, what, what this concept looks at is that we need all of these components when we look at a landscape scale. So we need to understand how things process, how they occur naturally without a lot of human intervention. Because let's face it, we as humans are changing everything across the world right now to where we are maintaining and balancing and increasing functional co structural complexity and to where we are producing. So we need this across a landscape scale. And with that, I think I'm right in the middle of my talk, so I'll take a break for some short questions before moving on. All right, at this point, I don't see any questions online. Anyone, uh, any questions here in St. Paul? Yeah, yeah I'm trying to formulate questions <laughs> as I ask it, but um, so in you know, a lot of the definitions of, of ecological forestry, continuous cover forestry, or new forestry, there seems to be this uh, focus on, on um, methods of management that don't uh, emulate, say, fully standard placing disturbance. Um, the, the triad concept we got to at the end there incorporates that in those high production plantations, I believe. But um, in, in, terms of, in terms of the natural disturbances out there, these do occur sometimes, and they're very important for certain types of forests. How is that addressed? Can you explain a little more how that's addressed throughout the literature, throughout these? various uh, concepts of ecological forestry. Yeah. Eli, would you like me to repeat the question? Or no, I think, um, I think we're good. I think that okay. I should have picked it up. Thank you, Marcella. Yeah, no, David, that's a great question. So I think they definitely do account for it. So ecological forestry is not saying we want to move everything to this kind of old, older growth stage. So I'm not going to say the word old growth here but to this older stand development stage. It's saying in those disturbance processes. So if we think about something like a stand replacing fire in red pine, and we'll go through an example using jack pine. So I don't want to give that one away yet. But with red pine, we even had that stand replacing fire. There would be biological legacy. So the fire doesn't hit everything everywhere. So there probably would be a standing red pine or white pine as a seed source. So there'd be biological legacy. And there'd also be this natural time to allow regeneration, allow recovery. So it definitely incorporates that. And um, I think it's important to account for those very short uh, return intervals, but high frequency disturbances that are stand replacing. Um, because they are important for a lot of species, um, not only for tree species, but even I know there is concern um, among certain groups, especially birders, about losing really early successional habitat. So re thinking again, not only at the stand scale when you're looking at this, but at the larger landscape scale. So how do we incorporate these disturbances across the landscape? A question from Ely, uh, good question, sort of on a similar theme. How do we rectify the potential conflict between continuous cover forestry slash alternative forestry and shade intolerant and early successional forest types? <laughs> Is the need for early successional habitat a pressing need? 
So I think it depends on, again, it all goes back to these goals <laughs> and objectives. And I guess that's why I really like silviculture because you have that ability to look at multiple ways to manage. Um, so I think I would say it's pressing potentially if we look at certain forest types at a landscape scale. And that's where it's really important. It's not just the individual stand. So it's looking at this broader landscape scale and also thinking about why you are managing. Um, what's what 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 area do certain species need? Um, and how do you think about that at a at a broader landscape? And there is going to be trade offs. You can't maximize everything. So you can't maximize early successional habitat at the same time that you're maximizing late successional habitat. You have to think about trade offs, um, what is important and how you can use your landscape to really provide all those resources that you need. That's all we've got online. Thanks, Marcel. Great. OK, we'll keep moving along then. And I do have an example about this kind of early successional habitat with. Oh, OK. So let's now talk about disturbances. So disturbances um, is any relatively discrete event in time that disrupts the ecosystem. And I think we'll get, I guess we'll get at this idea of discrete in a second. And then this disturbance recovery, uh-oh, is that? What's that? Saying plug in or find another power source. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> OK, so disturbance recovery regimes is the natural pattern of periodic disturbance, such as fire or flooding by the periodic recovery from the disturbance. So it's this idea, again, a disturbance of that, and there's this recovery, there's this process. Um, and this can change, this varies along gradients. and. It's really important to understand these underlying gradients. And in Minnesota, we're lucky with ECS. In Michigan and Wisconsin, you have habitat types. So there's a lot of really good information on how things like soil moisture, nutrients vary by different ecosystems and how that might influence this gradient of disturbance. So where, when we're thinking about these natural disturbance processes, where do we get this information? So one, one area we can get this information is old growth stands. So we can visit these stands that were not impacted by those previous destructive logging events. So good things, they're directly observable. You can see them, you can touch them, they're there. However, they are rare, relatively rare on our landscape. Um, and potentially they're not always the most representative. So they might have been uncut for certain reasons. So maybe they were really hard to get to. Um, maybe they weren't on the best sites. So there could be a potential, uh, are they representative of this broader ecosystem? We can also use these land survey records. Um, they provide this broad overview. And um, there's been lots of different research methods out there looking at these notes and understanding how to use them in the best way. They're relatively low resolution and coarse scale, um, and they often only identify major stand replacing disturbances. So in systems like northern hardwoods, they might, they likely did not record those single tree fall or small gap replacements that are really important components of that disturbance cycle. And then we can look at tree cores or lake cores. And these are both can give really great information. They're really time intensive. Um, tree cores less so than lake cores. So you can have really high resolution. But again, you're inferring what happened from the past. So things like fire scars you can identify but then you can't always identify individual tree fall or individual tree death, especially in our area where we do have pretty high decomposition rate. And lake cores, they're low resolution, 
um, but this broad landscape level look at these changes. And I had the opportunity to sail to see this lake core being taken, or not this lake core, but a lake core in Utah being taken. It's pretty cool, but uh, I felt really happy I was a forester because the person taking these lake cores, she had three sites and it took her basically three days to collect the lake cores. So maybe nine days in the field. And then she was doing her PhD. So the next four years were spent in the lab looking at pollen under the microscope and dissecting these lake cores piece by piece to get this broad um, record of landscape level change. And that just didn't sound fun to me. So <laughs> I felt very happy for the for what I was doing for my PhD. So but it does, it is this really cool look and it gives you this really long potential time period on how things have changed and especially picking up charcoal records for these broader landscape levels. So this uh, definition of disturbance, I said relatively discrete events. And we often think of disturbance looking into the past. So how can we figure out what the natural disturbance cycle is? But a question that we probably should be also thinking about is, are we only looking into the past or should we also start thinking about the future and thinking about not only what was what happened in the past, but what could happen in the future? And if Minnesota is getting either warmer and wetter or warmer with more um, weather, but those periods of wetness are going to be in more intense events, could that mean weather, but potentially droughtier summers um, as these events maybe um, increase in length or shorter winters. So thinking about not only what happened in the past, but thinking about what we should look to the, for the future. And a really cool study that's been developed in one of the first sites, one, well, the first site was on the Chippewa, Chippewa National Forest, is this adaptive silviculture for climate change. Um, and they created this great framework of looking at resistance, resilience, and transition, and putting these ideas that are sometimes very conceptual into actual on the ground treatments. Um, and I'm gonna kind of briefly touch on that, but I wanna get these terms out there with resistance being this ability to resist the disturbance, where resilience is this classic almost um, rubber band so you're able to bounce back from that disturbance. And transition is the most extreme where we're moving into something different, moving into a different potential future. So now let's talk about kind of some of these examples over the next 10 or so minutes. So um, one example we can look at is this adaptive silviculture for climate change was placed in a red pine stand. Um, and that was on the Chippewa National Forest. And there's this kind of underlying buzz or this interest of how do we increase complexity in red pine or how do we restore red pine? And I don't know if I actually like that word restore, but how, what are our pine forests of the future? And this is a picture of the lost 40 um, that the Minnesota, on Minnesota DNR land. And if you're looking at this photo, you can see red pine, white pine, you can see hardwood species. You see this structural and um, functional <clears throat> complexity within the stand. And we're lucky enough to have this great revised manager's handbook for red pine in the north central region that looks at a variety of ways to manage systems. So it takes, um, we'll call them conventional, it uses conventional ways um, that we have managed red pine in the past, maybe a clear cut system with artificial regeneration. But it also gives you this broader sense that there are multiple ways that we could manage red pine, whether it's a change in rotation length, whether it's a shift increasing species composition. And let's look at that in this kind of three legged stool from ecological forestry. So what can we do? We can incorporate biological legacies into regeneration harvest practices. So we can maintain species there. 
and maybe that's maintaining red pine. If your stand doesn't have shoot flight issues, maybe it's maintaining white pine. There's a lot of ways we can maintain biological legacies. Incorporate natural stand development processes into intermediate treatment. So thinning is a common tool we use in the lake states. I'm going to go through and look at a few different ways we can think about thinning. And then also allow this recovery periods between regeneration harvest. So allow stands to develop. And one of these, a few ideas of why this can be really important is that our red pine stands have gotten a bit younger. Um, if we look back at some of the historical records, it's estimated that over 30% or around 30% of our stands in Minnesota were over 120 years. So that's that's a good deal longer than some of our current rotation periods. So making sure as we think about our forest systems, incorporating this range of variability, this range of what a red pine forest can look like is I think an important tool for us that way it buffers us against certain disturbances, against um, certain issues. So let's look at some of the recommendations. So we can have this uncut stand and we can do different types of silvicultural treatments. So we can use, we could do a clear cut, but we can use reserves and we can aggregate these reserves or we can aggregate this retention or we can disperse this retention. Again, it's dependent on your goals, what you want to come up. This might give you a little more light for those shade intolerant species where this dispersed retention would give you a more continuous cover, more shade for maybe some of the mid tolerant or shade tolerant species that you want. And I like that um, there's this table in the manager's high handbook that includes a lot of different objectives. So we look at the traditional kind of regeneration um, but we also have something like blueberry production um, or campground quality. So again, we're looking at this broader idea of why we're managing. And then I mentioned these intermediate treatments and often intermediate treatments, especially in, in pine stands, um, focuses on maintaining um, more uniform conditions and we thin to release growing space, to increase growing space. Uh, but does that growing space need to be increased uniformly? Or can we increase this vari increased variation, have something like a variable density thinning, which may allow more growing space to some, less to others, and also allow differences to occur. And some of these tools, some of these features were incorporated when they develop the prescriptions and management for the adaptive silviculture for climate change. And if you haven't, I don't have time to go into this, but if you haven't seen this site, please, please look at, look up um, ACC or ASCC. Um, it's great. It's a really great resource. And again, I'll have a citation um, to a recent paper in the Journal of Forestry. So how does this maintain healthy forests? Well, concerns, drought might be, might be in our future as those rain events change. So thinning can increase resistance and resilience to drought, we've seen that. Um, insects and shoot diseases. Shoot blight is a concern in Minnesota, is a concern in the lake states. Red pine historically probably wasn't as even or monoculture as we have now in some of our stands. So increasing that diversity, we might be able to provide some buffering against some of those shoot blight issues. Um, an issue we have EAB, we would have never predicted EAB 20 years ago. Something that might be on the horizon that is, <laughs> is moving eastward is something like mountain pine beetle. So thinking about age class diversity at the stand and landscape level could be really important in our future. And then finally, this market variability. Forestry is a long term investment. 
you don't know what the market is going to be when you regenerate a stand. Having options is always good, always important. Okay, so that is kind of the red pine example. The next one I want to move into is this um, Kirtland's warbler example. So this is an example. This is this is a picture just recently from um, a program Eli and I co-direct um, where we're on the Schwamigan Nicolay looking at some planting for Kirtland's warbler habitat with young jack pine. And you can kind of see this wave pattern occurring, um, which is pretty cool. But one, one interesting thing, a recent uh, a study um, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan found was, so Kirtland's warbler needs this dense area and it's a relatively small age class that they need or size class that they need. Um, so it's a very large landscape level issue, but they need these dense areas interspersed with these open areas for um, breeding or for or feeding, so <laughs> for eating the insects. So as managers, as silviculturists kind of develop this, they are trying to play with what do the wildfire potentially look like versus what can we do um, to manage this? And I thought this was a pretty cool study where they looked at, um, this was a previous generation of planting. So you see these very dense areas and these little pockets where, so this was the planted area where this was an actual fire and you see this much broader variation. And I would argue that you do kind of see these wave patterns happening, which is what they've learned from and incorporated into that. So we're continually learning and continually using natural disturbances to inform how we manage. Um, and some of the lessons that they learned was you manage at a landscape scale. So different age classes of jack pine are important for different bird species. Fires leave legacy, so fires are not complete. Standing in downwood are important legacies that need to be incorporated. And also there's this range in variation. So again, it's not homogeneous at a stand or landscape scale. This variation, um, which is something researchers and scientists struggle with <laughs> when trying to account for this variation, but this variation is super important when we talk about forestry. So with that, let's wrap up with some final thoughts. These are the same thoughts I had at the beginning. So ecological forestry, or one of the other terms we covered, focus on using natural disturbance processes to inform and develop management strategies which increase complexity. We're again using the same silvicultural toolbox with, but with different desired future conditions. And we need multiple approaches when we're thinking about managing at a landscape scale. And now and in the future, foresters and silviculturists are increasingly managing for broad objectives, including wildlife, water, and maintaining forest health. So I promise you the citation page. <laughs> um, so I, I'll leave this up there for just a second since everyone has cell phones or screen captures um, to be able to capture this and this will be on the website and everything. Yeah, we'll, I, uh, I put that in the chat pod earlier. We will share this list in a format that you can copy and, and search for online or whatever uh, shortly after the presentation. So you can look for it uh, online. Great, and now let's take some questions. <laughs> I've got one online, uh, and this came in before your slide that asked the question, should we just be looking to the past? And so you may have addressed this, but maybe you have something to add. Question is, how is climate change taken into consideration in ecological forestry when we think about disturbance regimes? I think that's a really good question, and that's something um, that I think, whether it's ecological forestry or any of these forests, these terms that we covered, there's this kind of balance, this need to look to the past, but also look to the future. So I think that's really where this hot spot of research management is. And it's people, researchers are looking at this in multiple ways, but you on the ground as managers are also incorporating this um, even more now. So it's this link that I think we're kind of at. 
um, which is really cool, but also um, at the same time, the researchers or scientists, we don't have answers for all these questions. So, and some of the questions we're asking you, what's worked, what are you seeing on the ground? So, I don't know if that answers that question completely. Another thing that's interesting that uh, has come up at other discussions like this in the past is related to that. But, and you mentioned the shoot light issue and red pine. Uh, it, there are situations like that where the regimes that happened in the past, I mean, we think of red pine as requiring complete, you know, um, clearing. And in fact, fires, of course, are a mosaic. You would have had a lot of mature trees left. But um, we, with where, where we have stands that are heavily infested, you know, retaining mature trees can be problematic for regeneration. And so there are situations where looking to the past doesn't really <laughs> help. Looking to the future, uh, you know, doing a little more retention than we have in the past isn't going to completely help. And so there's a need, as always, just for some creativity mm -hmm. there. No, I completely agree. Any other questions here locally? All right, I'm not seeing any more online. I will um, make a few remarks here. We're going to come in right on time, um, uh, uh, unless unless we have other questions, which we would be very happy to have. But I want to thank Marcella for a great presentation. Um, I will remind folks that the presentation is being recorded. We will share a recording. It takes us a little bit to get it all coordinated and, and uh, stitched together and, and put online, but we'll have that in a couple of days. Those of you who have registered and watched online, uh, you'll get an email with that link when it goes up. Others can look at the um, uh, SFEC website for that announcement. Um, and we do have a question here um, that came in online a moment ago. Uh, this management approach seems well suited for commercial and public scale acreages. From a small woodlot owner's standpoint, is there a minimum acreage threshold for a management unit to be able to apply these approaches? I guess that's probably more variable. I guess it depends on what kind of forest type you have, what kind of system, and also are you able to make potential connections with maybe neighboring woodlot owners to increase the acreage of the sale? Um, but I think there are flexibility, um, and especially depending on what kind of soil type, if you have that nice sandy soil that's year-round operable, you might become very attractive, even if it is a smaller sale and maybe not as much wood coming off, but having potential broader operability could be really beneficial. So um, that was a really broad answer, but having not knowing exactly the forest or system or location, I would say um, I wouldn't discount it. Great. Last chance here. All right. Well, thanks, Marcella. It's been a good talk. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, watch our website for that recording, and I hope we'll see you next month for our next webinar. Signing off.